This is Father Sebastian, Master Fangsmith of the Sabretooth Clan and impresario of the Endless Night Vampire Ball. And you're listening to Hollywood Arcane, vampire culture, music, and magic with your special guest host, Johanna Moresco of the Crew Shadows. Greetings and welcome to Hollywood Arcane with Father Sebastian, that's me, vampires, magic, music, and the paranormal. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm your host, the impresario of the Endless Night Vampire Ball and Master Fangsmith of the Sabretooth Clan. Hollywood Arcane is an exploration and the deep dive of things that I find interesting and passion and I'm passionate about. And today we are going to have a very special guest that is dear to my heart. And I'd like to welcome my co-host, Johanna Moresco, violinist of the Crew Shadows. Hi! Howdy! Ha! I look different, don't I? Yes. <sighs> I'm sorry, I am filling in for Johanna today. She is at Dragon Con right now. She asked me to fill in, so I'll do my best, but don't hide me a violin. Just so you know, this is Patty Negri, my best friend and dearest buddy. And we travel all over the place. We just went to Hexfest together yep. and had a great time. So Patty, welcome to Hollywood Arcane. This is your first appearance as a, a host. It is. I am thrilled to be here. Thanks for letting me come on. Thanks, Johanna. Have fun wherever you are. And uh, happy to be here. Love this show. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, Johanna is at Dragon Con right now, uh, fiddling away in front of 3,000, 4,000 nerdy people. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I thought she was going to be on the show, but I guess she contacted you and tried to kind of jump scare me. That's right. I was going to put on a dark wig and see if we filled you, but we knew we wouldn't. <laughs> so um, we have Endless Night coming up yes. on Halloween. Yes. And are you ready for New Orleans? I am so ready for New Orleans. I'm excited. Already got hotel, already got flights. Um, working on the outfit still because I have to keep up with Yvonne, who I travel with. So I am so ready for New Orleans. And as you know, we were just there a couple of weeks ago, and it'll be a little cooler when we go back, I think. I hope so, too. But, you know, one thing about Yvonne is, did she get six different airline, uh, plane connections for you this time? Um, I I hope not. Last time I took, I think we had to go to, get, we got to New Orleans from Los Angeles via Bangkok. It was like 48 planes to get there because it saved $3. I don't know. Uh, it was a lot of flying. But I've been doing a lot of flying lately, so I think maybe she got a little bit better or not. So let's talk about New Orleans and Hexfest. Yes. Oh my gosh. It is the witch gathering of the world. Everybody who's anybody from the witchy world was here. Fiona Horn, all the way from Australia. And of course, Lynn, um, Lilith Dorsey, who I just had on my show, um, Voodoo Priestess, but everybody known and unknown from Europe and America and all over um, gathering together, teaching workshops and panels and rituals and drum circles. And we did the paddle boat and it, it was it was really fun. Yeah, I think the paddle boat was a lot of fun. Um, not only that, was it was just cool to meet all these magically minded people that were, you know, we're used to teaching and, and bringing people in that are, are kind of new to everything. And it was really great to be amongst peers that were highly magically minded. Yes, yes. We're usually like the smartest ones in the group teaching and this one, not so much. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 30, 40, ah, but it's awesome. But we were, um, they were still our peers and uh, it was so good because some of, uh, many of them I'd only met virtually like this. A lot of them have been on my show mm -hmm. and stuff, but to meet three-dimensional, there's still nothing better than three-dimensional. Well, what was, I, I thought it was really cool standing in line for the uh, paddle boat on Friday night and how they used that to open the weekend. Yeah, that was really cool. And just seeing all these witches that I've known about or heard about or met years ago or or and having all these magical peers yeah. was was really cool. And the seance in the end of the weekend yeah, um, was really cool. But again, we got to use stuff besides Ouija boards. <laughs> OK. Yeah. We could, we could use chalkboards. We could use, or we don't even need them, but it's fun. We don't need them. We're, we're a bunch of psychics. We can do everything. I know, but they're just, it's a, it's a visual tool. It's, it's. You don't need a visual tool with a bunch of add up witches and vampires. That is, that is true. And it was a wackety wackety Ouija board. Cause we had that other thing there. Again, this wasn't what even, was that? Huh? That was it was game. some game from the seventies that worked like a moving wobbly wobbly Ouija thing the guy said it had a whole spirit of its own but 
that was wild. It glue in the dark and and it was pretty cool. You could see it was yeah. made in the U.S. Yeah, because it yeah. was very thick plastic. Yeah, but that the houses were great. Christian Day and Brian Kane's house was gorgeous. Um, what was the gentleman Kevin and and mm -hmm. that yeah. other gentleman that we went out to across the river? Which yeah. the it yeah. made the Coven House from which uh, from American Horror Story look cheap. Yeah, every house we went into, beautiful old like Victorians, hundred, two hundred years old all of them filled with beautiful antiques and rugs and lamps and magical things. Everybody's kind of like me. Every solid surf and you is an altar. There's a skull. Here's an yeah, altar. Right. <laughs> you alter everything. Alter I just everything flat surface. Okay. <laughs> and um, it was, and you got to spend a couple more, a little bit more time there after I left. Yes. Yes. Well, we got to do some stuff together, which was really fun. Um, uh, after Hex Fest, and I got to stay there because then I started filming with um, Rob Thompson, who we both know, and the Ghost Finders. And then I got to go discover Baton Rouge, which is a beautiful haunted place we were. The rest of the city, me, but the ha haunted hotel we were at was great. And then back to uh, New Orleans. So, yeah. And now That's we're going fun. again. Yay. Yeah, we got to get Richard Lyell to make sure he's there he's, that week. I know. That's crazy. He moved there, he needs to be there. Yeah, I mean, especially the biggest event in uh, esoteric. Um, I mean, we're we're looking at one thousand five hundred people for endless night this Yay. year. So the House of Blues has given us more space, and we will show that soon. But we have the Crew Shadows playing, and for those of you who don't know what a Crew Shadow is, Patty, do you know what a Crew Shadow is? I hear that they're a band and they're fabulous, and I've seen them several times. What? No, do you mean what the thing is other than the band? Yeah. No, I don't. A crew shadow is the shadow that a gravestone makes. Really? Yeah. That's cool. I did not know that. Isn't that cool? It's something like that. Um, yes. But we'll, uh, we'll we'll figure that out later. So we have a special guest, and we have a veil to read for her mm -hmm. because she was going to be a rabbi. Wow. But she decided to, we're going to ask her about it. So before we announce our guest, do you have the veil ready? I do have the veil ready and I have the introduction ready. I am so ready. Rock and roll, Patty. Let's do it. All right. So do you want me to do the introduction first so we do the veil with her or? No, we'll do, read the veil, then we'll do the introduction. Ordination. Priest or priestess of the black veils. A priest or priestess of the black veils is known as a charis or chorus of the current, and refers to the ordination of adeptus practitioner into the currents of one of the pulses of Kitra, Muradu, or Ramkat. Ordination is a serious matter that requires a course of intense training and focus and a dedication of a year and a day of an acolyte attaining themselves into the specific current. Before someone can be ordained as a vampire priest or priestess, they must first have ascended to the level of vampire adeptus and must be an authority on the black veils in both night side and day side matters. Within the black veils, vampire priests and priestesses are recognized based on the following abilities. Perform one significant project in service of the family quest, benefiting the great work for the quest of immortality. Perform a lead of a group communion. Perform consecration, cleansing, attunement, and enchantment of a magical tools, weapons, or sacred space. Design and perform initiations, ascensions, blood and roses ceremony, vampire hand fasting, like wedding, um, and requiem risings, funeral rites. Attune the one of the pulses to one of the pulses, Kitra, Maradu, or Romcat. Still and tangible research with OBE, out-of-body experience, demonstrate the ability to enter into the state of an alternate consciousness, gnosis, at will. Once these abilities have been tested over a period of time, the acolyte proceeds to formal ordination. They perform and lead a communion with as many members of the family as possible in order to contribute energy to the rite of ordination and formally attune to their chosen pulse. Once this is done, they will consecrate their priestly instruments and take the oath and love and loyalty to further the preservation and prosperity of the family and current. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So 
we we've done some secret magic recently that we shouldn't talk about publicly yeah. that will be announced soon. That but, we're talking about publicly. <laughs> yeah, and uh, which pertains to what we read there. Yeah. So, who's our guest today, Patty? Our guest today, very you know her much better than I do, but the little I know her, she's fabulous. It is Heather Joseph Witham, PhD. She she's a folklorist whose extensive research in urban legends, myths, and folklore led her to be tapped for information by MythBusters team. She has appeared on camera in three pilot episodes and the entire 13 episode first season. Joseph Witham's role on the show ended after a third episode of the second season. She received her doctorate from the Folklore and Mythology program at UCLA in 1998. She is currently an associate professor at Otis College of the Art and Design in Los Angeles, California. So and let's bring her in. Yay! Hi. Hi, guys! Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have a, an official PhD on our class. <laughs> yes. I, I think um, you guys have way more expertise in your fields than any PhD probably could have. So I think we're all on even footing. Thank you. We, we have a, a couple questions for you today no um, that will be uh, good. So Johanna couldn't make it today. <laughs> that surprised me. Um, did she call you last minute and ask you to be on? Uh-huh. Because oh she thought she could do it. She thought she could do it. But with travel and hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and earthquakes and pestilence and locusts, she couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I actually saw a locust today. Did you? Ooh. I think I did. It looked like a big beetle, but it would look like a locust. That's um, I, could be wrong. I was going to my physical therapy and I saw it. So, okay. Um, Patty, why don't you go okay. ahead? All right. So Heather, why, oh, why did you decide to get your doctorate in mythology? Yeah, I know. That does sound weird, I mean, right? Your parents ask you. You're going to... <laughs> Everybody asked me. And they asked me the whole time I was there, too. They go, what are you going to do with that? And I didn't care. Because, you know, when you love something, when you're really into it, you just need to know more. And so I thought that for me, schooling was another way to get there. And I sort of came to it through, probably through two directions. One was literature. So I always always, always loved everything paranormal, fairy tales, myths, all of that stuff since the time I read Lord of the Rings when I was in, I think, fourth grade. And um, so I certainly came through it that way. And um, I, I mean, I read a lot of myths and I read a lot of fairy tales and probably memorized uh, a lot of them. But at the same time, in sort of parallel, you know, I have a family that um, has all... Some of them either have had magical experiences like you guys, and some of them had were practitioners to a degree, although they would never use the word magic because they were all Jewish. So on my, uh, my on my mother's side, her mother, who lost her whole family in the Holocaust, she lived with ghosts and they and she didn't like them, you know, but they followed her around. And uh, sometimes she would, you know, uh, find out things. Uh, about herself or others, but they followed her around and really kind of haunted her. It wasn't a, a, a good experience for her, but um, she was, you know, she was born with a call. And um, so it was probably always going to be that way. Or you could say it was the psychology of her situation. I don't know. Um, but on my dad's side, my dad um, was born in Burma, now, now Myanmar, and his family were... Um, Jews from the Middle East. So they were from Baghdad, they were from Aleppo, Syria, and they had a lot of really interesting magical traditions. My great grandma did, she was the expert, she did all the things, but my grandma Rachel, um, sort of, you know, any anytime something would happen, like I got hit by a car, so I was afraid to walk across the street, you know, I'd go to the psychologist, I hated her, it didn't work, you know, I'd, I'd stop at the corner instead of crossing the street, so grandma would then come over and throw some mud on you and chant, and, you know, she would fix it, so she was always fixing, she was doing things, and, um, or, you know, somebody stole money from my uncle's bar. She would do a whole ritual figuring out who stole it. You know, and she'd always, she'd always figure it out. And she thought these things, as serious as they sound, she thought they were a lot of fun. And so when I would talk to her about it, she would, you know, 
just be like, oh, those silly superstitions. And then she'd do something. So there's a lot of like ambivalence in that community about those kinds of practices. They do them anyway, but they don't necessarily um, call them magical at all. And they don't see themselves as practicing anything particularly unusual. Um, and they did not pass it down to, you know, sort of Americans of this generation. Once they migrated, that was kind of it for them because this environment didn't fit that for them. So, you know, I, so I got to grad school and I was going to study Celtic mythology. And then I realized, oh, I don't have to. I can actually study these practices that um, my family did. So I collected a lot of stories and um, went around and talked to everyone I could who were sort of holders of those traditions. And I learned a lot. And it's a good thing I did collect that because a lot of them have since passed and they did not, as I say, pass those things down. So they just don't exist except on paper. So, uh, so that's how I got there. That's how I, how I made it to, to folklore. So you told me in one of our conversations, you were going to, you were thinking about heavily becoming a rabbi. I was, I was, I was, you know, I grew up um, religious more or less, you know, we went to temple every Friday night and I got bought mitzvah and then I kept going to school till, you know, a couple more years. And I taught at the temple for a little while. So it was just part of, um, part of my life and a fun part of my life. Um, my kids don't think so, so much. They're like, really, what, what are you making this go to? So, but I never liked the actual services and stuff. And I always thought, you know, I could do this better. <laughs> I could make this more fun. And I really liked the idea of, I, I like ritual and I have worked with, I did also at that time work with some pagans and some witches. And um, I, I just like ritual of all kinds. And I thought, okay, I could do these weddings. I could do these funerals. I think I'll be a rabbi. And so I applied for a rabbinical degree the same time I, I applied for folklore. And so I was about to say yes to the rabbinical thing. And then I just, I realized I'm not a person of faith. <laughs> not um, at all. You know, I'm an equal opportunity believer. You know, when I had trouble getting pregnant, I went to my Santeria priest friend. When my shoulder okay. hurt, I went to a curandero. You know, when my grandma was visited one night by what I think is a Lord of Death, you know, I call the witch friend. So I, I'm an equal opportunity kind of um, paranormal believer. But in terms of, I do feel like if you are going to be a leader in a religious structure, you have to have faith some form of it. You have to know that that God or goddess or the many gods or goddesses you're talking to is there for you. And I, and I don't have that, which is why I'm a scholar. So, because we don't have to believe we get to go see and talk to great people and hear about amazing things, think about them and write about them. So that works better for me. I think. You know what? I heard once that the difference between a priest and a shaman is a priest encourages faith in people and re helps people reinforce the faith within them and a shaman channel spirits. Mm. Yeah, so folklorists, we like the shamans. It's <laughs> a little better. <laughs> and, and Ouija boards. I was laughing when you were talking about the Ouija board stuff because I grew up doing those with my mother. She loved to, to consult the Ouija boards. So now I have quite a, a good collection and I, you know, I bring them in and they're about the only thing that scares students. Isn't really? that Mm -hmm. They do. I, I have quite a collection. I've been using them. My mom got me one when I was seven or eight. I did my first seance then. But it does scare people. I remember being in Vegas filming and I have a, a it is a real Ouija board, but it's like shaped like a briefcase. But you could tell it's a real board. Oh. Being in a Vegas casino, people avoid you like the plague. <laughs> like, ha, ah, evil is at hand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, I've heard that Ouija boards are the uh, pagers for the spirit world. The pagers. I like it. pager. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Text message for the spirit world. But I, I, my experience with Ouija boards is, first of all, the spirits can't spell well through them. <laughs> That's um, true. And that usually don't get what you're, you, you don't get what you're speaking through. But Patty seems to pull it off. I don't know how she does it. How what, do you do it? Because what I do, the way I lift the veil, the way I've been doing since I'm a kid, and I'm very specific of who gets to come in. Mm. So you don't bring in anybody out there. Do you want anybody in your house? Really? You let serial killers and the crazy guy next door. Be careful who you let in. Um, and 
And then you always keep in control. Since I was a little kid, I just knew that this was our realm of existence. They really did have to play by our rules unless we gave them our power. But everybody gives them their power with fear and anger and confusion. So um, I've always had good. They cannot spell. I think spelling goes out the thing. But that's why even more than Ouija boards, I use chalkboards with a planchette that's got chalk. Okay. And they could write different languages and they have, I've had everything drawn from a, a perfect Virgin Mary. It was a Catholic, a perfect in the dark, four people on your fingers going like this and you move it. And it's a perfect art drawing. Mm -hmm. One, I, I'm not going to get political or anything, but it was Trump days. And um, somebody, I was with a white house correspondent and I was with a, a, a news correspondent and a white court house correspondent just died. And she's like, what the heck is going on at the White House? Fingers moving, fingers moving. We moved the planchette and they'd drawn a perfect rat. Oh my gosh. Anatomical, long tail. <laughs> and in the dark, on a planchette. So it's a lot of spirits draw better than they write. And a lot of them don't speak English. Mm -hmm. So I've had it, you know, and I'm a half a Mediterranean Jew. So I get all of that. It's never evil. I'm just a Dutch boy. Uh, my uh, my ex girlfriend's mom used to call me Van Helsing. Huh? Oh, yeah, because a lot of people don't know that the Van is Dutch and Von is German. Oh. Yeah, and so Van Von Dutch, the brand is not right. I know that's sidetracking here, but um, no, it has to do with vampires, so it's not sidetracking at all. He was the best character in the book, Van Helsing. He I know he knew everything. I was hoping to see him in uh, Last Voyage of the Demeter, but they didn't have him. Oh, really? I haven't yeah. seen it yet. I heard bad things. But the ending was unexpected, so that was good. It subverted my expectation. Okay. I'll check it out. We'll have to see it, yeah. Yeah, we got to get our vampire movie, Vampires on Vampires project moving. Yes. We were, we're looking, Rob, I'm going to announce it now, just so we motivate Rob to get it going. But Rob has this idea to do vampires and vampires reviewing movie show, movies and TV shows by vampires and witches. So they had me as a test run on uh, vampire movie on witches movie coven last week, and it was great. And, and we did Renfield, and I learned a lot about reviewing movies from very <laughs> movie reviewers. All right. So that was pretty cool. So what's our next question for your, her, Patty? Um, okay, this is a good one and move us right into it. So with this, the rabbi training and the, this, um, how did you discover the vampire community? Oh, gosh. Um, I probably read Dracula when I was maybe like a freshman in high school. So I've always looked for, you know, um, stories about paranormal beings, starting, you know, probably wizards were my favorite you know, whether it was Gandalf or Merlin or, of course, Dumbledore now. Um, and then it just moved into other kinds of magical creatures. And so, you know, definitely through literature and I've read, I mean, I, I'm sure we've got a, a literature list in common about reading about vampires. And I, and I prefer fiction, although there's a lot of great nonfiction that talks about how many people, how many reports there are you know, in the 18th and 19th centuries of people seeing, you know, their ex-husband um, or, you know, the, the the troublemaker down the road on the Greek island of Mykonos and the whole town has seen, you know, this dead guy pop up and he's, I mean, they're not biting people. They're usually running around, going back to their house, stealing shoes, you know, stealing pies off the, off the windowsill, going back and trying to have sex with their wife. And, you know, they're doing things like they're bothering, they're botherers um, in all of those reports. So they're kind of like still revenants and things. You don't have as many reports of the, you know, gentleman aristocratic vampire post uh, Polidori's story, the vampire. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I, I think that that whole story is really, um, really tragic because I don't know how much you know about John Polidori, but um, you know, he wrote the vampire after his experience being Lord Byron's doctor or drug dealer. I'm not sure which um, when they were at the oh, Dio dot, he was something, he was something. And I know he had a crush on Mary Shelley, not yet Shelley, but, and you know, it was just this wild experience that they had with um, telling ghost stories and Mary Shelley ending up writing Frankenstein and 
Um, and Lord Byron and John Polidori got in a big fight and he got fired and had to go home. And he was only 20 at the time. So, you know, he wrote this story. He published it about this aristocratic vampire who was very evil called De Riven. And uh, people accused him of plagiarizing it from Byron. So he was, you know, sort of humiliated and depressed and he went to med school and became a doctor. So he was a writer, a doctor, and then he became a lawyer. And then at 25, he killed himself. Oh, wow. It was just like all his genius. He couldn't find a place to channel it. And, you know, so he, but he is almost single-handedly responsible for creating that image of the aristocratic vampire. Um, someday someone will make a, a movie about him. Gorgeous, beautiful young man, just, you know, who didn't find a place. As wow. it were. Yeah. It, it I mean, really that's was. a lot to become a doctor and a lawyer and a writer. And a writer. Five. That's, that's a lot of homework. You yeah. a lot more time back then because they weren't on the internet all day. <laughs> there you go. I, I think you're not entirely wrong. TikTok takes a lot of time. Yes, that's the one. That yeah. is the one. So anyway, so I read all these stories and I love these stories, Charlene Harris and Anne Rice and, and all of this. And um, I probably got a lot more into it when I was, um, I was a circus promoter for a couple of years and I ended up in New Orleans for like six months promoting a circus. And that's when I found the Garden District bookstore and was introduced to the Vampire Lestat. And then I was like, oh my God, you know, this is just, this is beyond, just like everybody else who, who read that back then. It reads differently now, but then, you know, it, it was so glorious. And, um, and then, you know, um, I, I just looked at it as literature. I didn't really realize that there was a vibrant, active subculture at that time. Um, and I, I met Sebastian, actually, because, and he doesn't remember this, but I'll show you video and then you're going to go, oh my God, we're all so beautiful and young. Um, but I was in New Orleans in like 2007 or eight and I was um, meeting with the Anne Rice uh, fan club and filming some of them at their ball that they have. It must have been 2007. And I was interviewing um, the Haunted History Tours guy and talking to him about um, Sydney talking to him about the vampire tours he was doing and who else did i talk to suzy q obviously different vampire literature kind of people sherilyn kenyon was there and then i was going somewhere and someone walked up and they go oh you have to meet father sebastian I'm like okay <laughs> so i walked up and i go hey can i interview you right now you were just standing there and you go yeah let's go over here and you took me back there was an alley there and there was a chair or two just there in the alley. I don't know what you were doing. And you just gave me 15 minutes of your time and I interviewed you. And then as I was walking out, you go, Hey, um, Chi Chi. And uh, do you want to talk to, to this young lady over here? And so I got five minutes of Chi Chi and Johnny too. Oh, that's great. And that's when I met you. But, and then, and then I didn't see you for years. And, uh, I, I teach at this place. that's like super open to, a lot of ideas. I'm like, I want to teach this vampire literature and lore class. And they're like, okay, you know? Um, and I think it's, it, it's not just about vampires. It's about outsiders. So it's about this idea that if you don't quite fit, you are um, accused of something or you're treated differently or you have more power or, you know, it, it's something that students and young people really relate to. Plus they're, they're artists. So they all want to draw vampires and create vampires also. <laughs> but um, so I was teaching this class here and I had this one um, student who, who's a light worker and she was just wonderful. Um, Carrie Slutskaya. And she's part of the vampire community. And um, a few years later, I, I had had someone coming in to guest speak on, you know, we talk about literature a lot of the time, but we started really engaging the subculture after Noreen Dresser wrote that book about American vampires. And she's a folklorist too, who I know. And, um, and she, she had, Carrie had been in the class and a few years later she texted and was like, Oh, do you want to talk to father Sebastian? And I'm like, Oh yeah, I saw him years ago. <laughs> I didn't know where you were or, 
you know, what was going on in your world. And you were super gracious and came in and guest spoke from a first person perspective about vampire subculture, which was, you know, a totally new thing. And, oh, Patty, you should have seen the students. They were like, oh my God. Oh my God. I mean, it, it was great because he was like a super celebrity to them. And uh, you know, it, it was really a lot of fun. And the cool thing also, then he started he coming, which is really gracious of you, um, annually. And I got to see his teaching style changed and developed and evolved every year. And it was fantastic. And so when I heard that he was doing this vampire university stuff, I was like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. You know, that's, I, that's where he is now. He's, he's totally that person. So that, that's how I met Sebastian. <laughs> and I'm still, oh, no, that's awesome. Yeah. In the back alley. I like it. Back alley. Yeah. That's lucky you're lucky you survived. Yes, <laughs> indeed. I am. I am. You always take me to fun places though. Well, that's, that's the thing. We're going to be in New Orleans for a couple of days. Yep. And just yep. An used to get out of town. An excuse to go to New Orleans. Um, <laughs> no excuse needed ever. Um, and we'll we're gonna eat well. I guarantee that. Yes, yes, we are. I'm gonna go <laughs> go make some good reservations. So you were on MythBusters. Can you tell us about that? Well, I was doing. Um, I still do. You know, occasional like somebody finds you from somewhere, and you're never quite sure where. Yes. Um, and they call you, and they go, "Hey." do you know about um, these flying machines and Indian mythology? And you're like, yeah, I could talk about that. I don't know about them, but I will find out by tomorrow. You know, <laughs> I do know how to research. And so I was doing a lot of those like kind of one-off things. Um, and I think like, I think at that time it was like sightings. I, I did something about Tutankhamun and mummies. And I think I, I did something about the Hale Bob Comet and the other side was another one that was a lot of fun. And so then they called me and were like, Oh, let's do this, this stuff. And you want to come up to San Francisco? And I'm like, yeah, I want to come up to San Francisco. So I would go up there and film and those people. So that was the only like long-term sort of series I got to do. And it was a, just great fun because the people who were um, involved in it were science-based really they were builders and creators and engineers and the guy who created the show um peter Rees, i'm still in touch with him he's you know just this wildly creative storyteller who wanted to actually test and do science they weren't talking about myths of course they were talking about urban legends um which are totally different but um but it was yeah it was a lot of fun i enjoyed it a lot what was your favorite episode or favorite project on that they did one about, um, are there people who, you know, they used to, um, some, sometimes they would in the Victorian era put bells um, outside of a coffin and you'd have something inside to ring it, to oh, put yeah. a finger, just in case somebody was actually still alive, which, you know, does happen from time to time and place to place. Did, did that ever work? Um, no, it wouldn't work because you would suffocate. And that's, I think, what they were testing. So they, they, this, this guy, Jamie, had a warehouse where he did all his, like, building of things. And so they brought a bunch of dirt into this parking lot of this warehouse. And I think they had a pig corpse of something. And I think they put, they buried it out there. And then I think they put one of the guys in there who then panicked and had to get out. And they were testing if the coffin would break you know, if you were actually alive, would you have time before you suffocated or died? And I, I can't remember their conclusion. I'm pretty sure you were just going to, once you were buried, you were dead. That was it. Yeah, that was, that was dead. it. <laughs> so that was fun. So Heather, I hear that you are writing a book or biography on vampire history. Is there anything you could tell us about that? Ooh, not sure what I should reveal. Um, it's, it's going to be a great, really fun, very interesting book. It starts in the 1990s. You know, you might question that and say, why aren't you starting in the Victorian era? You know, the Victorian era kind of is, you know, the, 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 the heart of vampire literature, but not so much maybe vampire culture. And if it was, we don't really know. You know, the vampires that were written about then were these solitary kinds of beings. The vampires in the 90s started to come together and form a culture, mostly in New York City, 
um, but maybe other places too. So we're, we're rooting it in that time period and um, it's going to have a lot of surprises and it's going to be fascinating. Oh, can't wait. Can't wait. One of the things I remember coming to, I remember before the internet, uh, before there was widespread internet, there was a message board called alt.vampires and it spelled vampires with a Y. And um, a lot of the people that I know today that have been around since then, mm -hmm. okay, were on that message board. And that's why the original vampire culture of the internet usually spelled vampire with a Y, was I think because of that group in honor of John Palladori. And so um, you should check that out uh, for your research. And yeah. thank you. Yeah, I, I think that the 90s was is definitely a great place to start because that's when Vampire the Masquerade came out. That's when the uh, um, all Vampire Almanac came out. The first Vampire Codex came out. Mm -hmm. um, the height of uh, vampire movies with Blade, Underworld, and um, it, Interview with the Vampire, mm -hmm. and what else? Uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Mm -hmm. So, and, and of course, the Memnock Ball in New Orleans, which turn New Orleans into a vampire city. You don't so, think it was before? Um, I think that really was the adrenaline shot in the heart mm. um, was interview with the vampire because, you know, Vampire the Masquerade was the first thing that everybody could be the vampire protagonist. Okay. And that started in 91, but they started LARPing in 92. So live action role play really helped out. And a lot of the people that were in the vampire culture that started, started with gaming because they were going to the vampire games to find out people to um, find out other people that identified as vampires. So the vampire mass, the masquerade was actually a masquerade. Mm -hmm. And because the goths, the goths rejected us like, I remember in a supermarket, a guy was like, um, I was in camo, so I was in khakis and a, on a polo shirt. Mm -hmm. And this there was this hardcore goth guy with, you know, spiky hair, sunglasses, pale makeup, uh, red lipstick. And he was British, so, you know, Austin Powers teeth. And he uh, had skinny pants and pointy shoes on. And I went to him, uh, I saw a little kid pull him, pull him on his cardigan and he turned around and looked at the thing and he goes, yes, child. <laughs> and the, the, uh, the kid goes, are you a vampire? And he pulled his glasses down and he goes, no child, I'm a goth. I won't wear fangs and I do not drink blood nor do I think I'm immortal. I worship death. And he put his glasses up yes. and he said, see you later and he was like so dramatic and i was like <laughs> oh my god so i remember going to the golf clubs in new york and even the owner of slimelight london when she came to meet me in new york at, i met her at a bar called london no londonville justine mm -hmm. this went into the uh early 21st century she pulled a she had a backpack and she pulled it out and opened it up and there was hundreds of letters and emails saying that vampires are taking over the goth clubs. They were threatened. Yeah. 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 And so, so they should be because we throw great parties. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the thing was, is that she goes, anybody that gets a reaction like this has to work for me. And I was like, all right, I'll work for you. <laughs> yeah. So, That's nice. I'm great. sorry. I, I, I can't get over you wearing khakis and a polo shirt. <laughs> I, 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 when we're both in town at the same time, I see you almost every day of the, of, of the year. I, I, khakis and a polo shirt. I've all, never seen you anything but black. Ah. I know. Um, me, me and khakis and a polo shirt's a thing. So, um, Halloween, not, but not the fall after. We, we got to keep on track because we only have an hour here. I want pictures, <laughs> pictures of the khaki. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so what fa facets of the vampire community history are you most inspired by so far? 
Oh, <laughs> I like everything. I, I like to hear about how people got into it. If they were awakened or they just started hanging out with friends or, you know, what is it that draws them? And I, I also like the sort of magical aspects of it. I like to hear about the energy exchanges and, mm -hmm. you know, when I, now I'm understanding there is, um, you know, a very loose, um, religion behind it as well, or you, you might not like the word religion group of grouping of spiritual practices also behind it and embedded in it. And, um, also I think, you know, it's sort of open enough that people are adding to that all the time. It's, um, yeah. an evolving kind of belief system. And I find that really fascinating because as I'm researching now, it's happening now. Um, and so I'm getting to watch some of the things people are doing, whether it's a howl or it's a, you know, a dance or whether it's some kind of ritualistic reading of material and, or gathering of energy. So I, I am really fascinated by all of that. This is my book of September. I'm going to be doing a book of the month club for Hollywood Arcane. Uh -huh. Magic Without Tools by our, our first guest of this season, John Wild. And he has opened my mind to a lot more. I mean, I'm used to man manifesting and moving life force around and sorcery and magic and stuff like that. But Magic Without Tools goes into like 10 different types of shielding and energy, energy manipulations, metasurgery, reincarnation. Um, it really, it seems to be very much in agreement with the Black Veils but goes into how to do things right okay and magic without tools i'm about halfway through and i'll i'll say i'm i, I suggest you both read it okay it. I mean. yeah it's 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 really it's not a vampire book per se but like i'm reading about unique shields empathetic shield and i'm gonna suggest this for a lot of vampires and I think that um, people in the Order Sturgavai and the Sabretooth Clan would benefit greatly from it. So if you follow the Black Veils, this book is right up the right up the uh, the lane that would help you expand. Other than knowing the terminology and how to do the basic stuff, okay, this kind of like fills in a lot of the blanks that the Black Veils doesn't cover. So, like for example, he talks about perceiving it, perceiving versus seeing and that you perceive energy you don't see it so it's it's we're gonna have to bring them back on the show for another another class but as uh, another uh uh show because i learned so much so far and you know i know about energy gathering and using the energy for healing and stuff like that but this just goes into a lot a lot more things that i never thought of so highly recommended thanks i'll pick it up so what's our next question our next question is on this book that you are writing who are some of the people you've interviewed already um i may have interviewed someone in this show <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. i've spoken to victor magnus um who i find really fascinating he um he was in some of those early um uh classes that father sebastian was doing during the pandemic um, so he, he's really interesting. He knows a lot of interesting things. I spoke to Gab Gabrielle Penavaz, who, um, she's kind of like a Renaissance woman who does clubs and art and life with abandon. She's, she's really a fascinating person. And I think she was kind of central to that nineties club scene. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just last week spoke to a guy named Mike Hideous from a band called the Empire Hideous that was in an early club, uh, vampire club in New York. And, um, you know, with a name like that, you don't know what to expect, but he was about the nicest guy you ever met on the phone. I, I really was fascinated. And next week I'll be speaking to Chi Chi Valenti. So I'm really looking forward to that. So I've, I've been meeting some great people and there's a few others here or there that may or may not show up in this volume um maybe they'll be in later volumes and uh, and you as well patty but uh so I, i've been meeting great people i the thing is like you know every single vampire i've, I've met 
has some fantastic stories and has been really kind and open with me. So um, that's been, I don't know that it's a surprise, but it's, it's been a pleasure, you know, cause I'm fascinated all the time. That's awesome. And so why are we doing decades? Decades. Well, you know, it's just a, um, a way to organize looking at vampire culture through time um, and, and through different experiences and through different people's perspectives, I okay. guess you would say. So, yeah. You know, the 90s is a great place to start because, you know, the 80s was the embryo, the womb of vampire culture. And, you know, Dark Shadows events were where people met before, but the vampire community came out of the coffin in the 90s. I like that term. Yeah. <laughs> do you know how that term came to be, came to be sure at least in i mean it's it's a convergent term so a bunch of people have used it so mother was a gay club okay and we did thursday nights with long black veil and what happened was there was this lonely kid sitting around we chi chi and johnny built us a coffin okay and they would put the coffin in the basement which was like a lounge and we would sit there and we would sit around the coffin and one kid goes, my parents just don't understand me. Oh, I'm, I'm awakening to this new vampire world and, and I'm discovering what I am, but I, I can't come out of the coffin to them. Oh. And we were just like, that's it, light bulb. Oh my God, that's awesome. And he was like, come out of the coffin. That's, that's, that's brilliant. And that's where it came into the vernacular of the lexicon of the Black Veils. Perfect. I really so, like that. <laughs> um, I, that is amazing. I look out of the closet, out of the broom closet, out of the coffin. It all makes sense. I have a question. Since you are, again, historian and a folklorist, and then what facets of the vampire community history have you, you personally been most inspired by? Oh, gosh. That's a great question because I I'm fascinated by everything and I like to see places where things happen, you know. So um, so I went to Whitby um, in England, which is where uh, Bram Stoker hung out for a while and and wrote when he was sort of on vacation from uh, working at the at this theater for Henry Irving in, in London, who is one of the influences on Dracula, apparently, you know a very arrogant, possibly dreadful man with a lot of talent um, who bossed Bram Stoker around quite a bit. I think there were a lot of influences actually on, on who uh, Dracula was. So, you know, um, I guess I, I probably like you guys and a lot of people, I have a, just a particular um, love for the Victorian era. You know, I have bustle skirts and top hats and all sorts of things that make me I have a Victorian aesthetic. I love clutter. I love teacups and candelabras and whatever. So probably anything written in that time period, you know, um, uh, uh, Joseph Sheridan, Le Fanu's, um, Carmilla, I really love, uh, along with Dracula and just anything written in that era and in that space. And I go to England and feel like I'm there. Cool. Yeah. Beautiful. So we're running out of time. Yes. Okay. We want to know when do you think this book will be out? Um, there is only one more chapter to write in terms of it being a rough draft, and then we'll we'll do the revision. And revision involves, you know, my rewriting and then giving it to an editor um, who your producer knows actually, um, oh. and, and and him organizing reorganizing it and saying this doesn't fit here, and then we'll. <laughs> We'll take his all of his comments into account. So I think, you know, um, while I think it'll be done done in a few months, it takes a little bit longer than that to get it published. So within six months, I would imagine. Oh, cool. Yeah. And let's, let's see how the vampire community reacts to it. I'm very curious. I hope they like it. And some of them are in there. So... <laughs> I really well, we'll, hope we'll they like it. We'll do a charging on this book tonight because it's a super moon. It's a it blue is. moon. And we'll we'll have the vampires come together and put some energy into it. That would be That's wonderful nice. and helpful. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Patty, what's our last question? Uh the where can we find you question? Or the question before that? 
we just asked that question. Oh, we did. Yeah. Where can we where can we find you? So if people want to go, I love this woman. I want to know more about her, what she's doing, where she is. Well, so I'm redoing my website, so I'm not giving you that. But people can email me at hwitham at otis.edu. And a lot of people do who, you know, I don't know. It's a it's a, a professional um, email for, through my school. So um, and, and it's the best way to find me. And I welcome all questions. I don't welcome weird criticism. You know, sometimes people, you know, email you and they're like, why did you do that? Well, I'm email me, ask me a question. I'm, I'm around. I will answer. Well, thank you, Heather, for coming on Hollywood Arcane. And thank you, Patty, for surprising me. Thank okay. you. This was fun. <laughs> so um, we, uh, we have our, uh, we're going to take a break for next week uh, because I'm going to be with my mom. She's not doing so good. So I have to be in Florida for mom. And then it's the Salem Vampire Ball weekend. So I'm going to be going up there with a couple of people and we're going to, Johanna will be there and we might do an episode from there. So um, rock and roll. Thank you very much for coming on board. Um, Patty, where can we find you? They can find me everywhere. Bathroom walls. Are, no, um, pattynegri.com. <laughs> um, all the social medias. You can get to the correct, real non, I mean, legitimate me from my pattynegri.com. Um you could buy my everything from my magic panties, my Patty's power panties to my spellcaster line at Mystery Control, which we're going to have to get some Hollywood Arcane stuff there as well. Uh, Mystery Control by our producer. But just all the social medias, pattynegri.com. Um, my regular podcast, same producer, is The Witching Hour, available um, everywhere you get podcasts, just like this one, um, YouTube and, my, and uh, on my page in video. So... Thank you. This was fun. You have a great show. Cool. Fun. And you guys can subscribe to um, this podcast anywhere podcasts are found. Uh, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, and of course, Podbean, which is our main distributing network. And I want to give a shout out to Rob and Christine for making our lives easier as they are so professional and great producers. Thank you, guys. Um, I'll see you guys down by the river in Salem uh with Yana and uh have a great time be well and rock and roll guys <laughs>